Hello, everyone, and welcome to tonight's lecture. Всем привет и добро пожаловать на нашу лекцию. It's great to be speaking tonight. Um, in the first lecture in a new series we're launching here at EPIC, the Irish Emigration Museum, on hidden histories of the Irish abroad, and also to be speaking as part of the wonderful Dublin Festival of History. Before we get into tonight's talk, I wanted to do a little bit of housekeeping. If um, one thing unites Irish and Soviet history, it's audiences who love a good argument. Now, unfortunately, we can't have a row in person, but that's what the YouTube comments are for. If you have any questions for after the talk, leave them in the YouTube comments and our moderation team here will look through the questions and send them on to me. So feel free to comment throughout the talk and then I'll get to your question then hopefully at the end. So let's get into our topic today. Today, we're talking about the Irish in the USSR. But first, just a little bit about myself. My name is Morris Casey. I'm originally from Care, County Tipperary, although some of you may have noticed that there's at least one thing that unites me and Vladimir Lenin, which is an acquired South Dublin accent. Lenin legendarily received his from um, an English tutor in London who came from Rat Mines, whereas I received mine from doing my undergraduate at Trinity College Dublin, which was then followed by my MA in Cambridge University, and I recently completed my PhD at the University of Oxford. I'm the current DFA historian in residence at EPIC here, EPIC, the Irish Immigration Museum. And this is a role that's been generously funded by the Department of Foreign Affairs to support and highlight pioneering research into the Irish diaspora. So, Let's begin. Oops, I need to click back in. Oh, sorry, some tech issues. Great. Irish people in the USSR can be slotted into two broad categories, tourists and emigrants. There were many hundreds, even thousands of the tourist category. Even in the late 1920s and early 1930s, or throughout the 1930s, it was adventurous, but not impossible to holiday in the USSR from Ireland. But this talk is not about tourism to the USSR. It's about emigrants in the USSR. The first part of this talk looks at Irish emigrants, in so particularly in Soviet Russia, during the immediate decades after the revolution, which is my own area of expertise. The second part of this talk um, looks more briefly then at Irishness in the Soviet Union, what ordinary Soviet citizens might have thought of Ireland and Irish culture. In many ways, the story of Irish emigrants in the USSR echoes the experiences of other Irish emigrant communities. There is a familiar longing for home and recognizable experiences of new possibilities in culture, social life, and even sexuality. But I also want to make the case that the Irish in the USSR present a fascinating, complex, and particular emigrant experience defined by participation in a revolutionary society. One that, at least in theory, delegated to each individual a role in building a new world. The Soviet past, as Ronald Grigor Suni writes, has never just been about one country at one time, but about the hopes, rightly or wrongly placed, about alternatives in human history. The history of the Irish in the USSR is therefore not just about the Irish abroad, it is about emigration with the specific intent of transforming society as we know it. Let's begin our story at a natural starting point. Moscow's Red Square with a red flag flying foul. In 1932, the Moscow Daily News, an English language newspaper targeted at the expat population in the USSR, printed a letter from Thomas Orr Ford, a retired British Navy captain from Donegal. In the autumn of 1932, Ford, a communist sympathizer, arrived in the USSR with his wife with dreams of becoming a carpenter. This letter to the Moscow Daily News channeled his naval past and carpentry experience. He wrote, walking across the Red Square today, I noticed that the Soviet flag, which flies over the main dome of the Kremlin was fouled. This is a nautical expression signifying it was not flying clear, but had got fouled by the changeable wind twisting it round the flagstaff. This is not as it should be. This flag in this location should of all others at all times fly clear. 
Ford then suggested how he would fix this issue and signed off saying, if this is desired, I would be glad to submit a proposed design of mounting. T or Ford. How did an Irish man and his wife end up as Moscow residents? I'm sure that's the kind of question that brought you here to this talk tonight. Perhaps you were surprised there was such a thing as an Irish community in Soviet Russia. You'll be even more surprised to learn then that Thomas R. Ford and his wife were not the only Irish people in Moscow in 1932. They were not even the only people from Donegal. Indeed, historians may one day speak of this week as the week in history that the Royal Astronomical Society found evidence of life in the atmosphere of Venus and also when Morris Casey made a similarly extraordinary discovery that a disproportionate number of Irish people in Soviet Russia came from Donegal. So, let's start answering those questions. When did Irish emigration to Soviet Russia begin? It's perhaps more illuminating to ask, why did Irish people first emigrate to Soviet Russia? The answer is represented by this picture, which I'm sure will be familiar to many of you. Those of you who are familiar with this picture will know the story of how, in 1920, Roddy Connolly, the son of James Connolly, traveled to Moscow to meet Lenin and discovered that Lenin had a Rathmines accent. Roddy Connolly arrived to what was then Petrograd, later Leningrad, and now St. Petersburg, to participate in a Congress of the Communist International, also known as the Comintern, and this photo was taken during its opening um, ceremonies. So Roddy was not an Irish tourist, but he wasn't an Irish emigrant. He was an Irish emissary, a representative of the Communist Party of Ireland in Russia. Let's take time to answer an important question for our talk. What was the common turn? The common turn was the organizing body of international communist parties, founded by Lenin in March 1919 as a means of providing institutional guidance for the world revolution. Its most active headquarters was in Moscow. It also had a headquarters in Berlin, at least until the Nazi rise to power. And why we need to learn about the Comintern is because interactions with the Comintern's many organizations brought the vast majority of Irish emigrants to Soviet Russia, um, to, it brought the vast majority of Irish emigrants in Soviet Russia to Soviet Russia, particularly, of course, in the time that the Comintern existed up until 1943. This is true from the first evidence of emigration from Ireland to the communist state that I found, which comes from 1921. When I was in the Moscow archives in 2018, I found arrival questionnaires filled out by two arrivals to Petrograd from Ireland, Sydney and Rosa Arnold. Who were these two early arrivals from Ireland to the USSR? Sydney was a Lithuanian socialist who had lived in Dublin for many year years, and Rosa was his Irish wife. The questionnaires reveal that Rosa was in her 40s in 1921, was Irish by birth, and came to Petrograd um, for the same reason as her husband to work as a translator at the Comintern Congress. I found a few details about Rosa Arnold, unfortunately, not even her maiden name, but Sydney is a figure who can be traced with relative ease. The census records of early 19th century Ireland show that the second largest foreign-born population in Ireland in the early 20th century was the Russian population, which was normally synonymous with Ireland's Jewish population, and in particular, Lithuanian Jewish population. Now, while I don't know exactly Sidney Arnold's religious identity, he was Lithuanian, so presumably part of this wider emigrant community. And he can be found on the pages of the feminist journal, The Irish Citizen, talking about Bolshevik topics and translating Russian literature. He was also a member of the Socialist Party of Ireland, which later became the Communist Party of Ireland. Playwright Sean O'Casey remembered Sidney Arnold in his memoirs as someone who had changed his name to Semyon Aronson as a mark of respect for the Russian Revolution. It's my um, theory that actually Semyon Aronson, Semyon Aronson was Sydney's um, original birth name. In June 1921, Eugenie Bouvier, a Russian-born suffragette active in the campaign for women's suffrage in Britain, returned to her ancestral home and met the Arnolds in Petrograd. She wrote a letter back home to Sylvia Pankhurst, another revered suffragette, and she described how she had met Sidney Arnold and another Irish woman at the monument to Catherine the Great, holding copies of an English language radical newspaper, The Communist. This is the last evidence of the Arnold's life in Russia that I've been able to uncover so far. I do believe that they returned to Dublin because a Sidney Arnold appears in some of the Irish cultural press in the late 1920s as well. 
there was one consistent experience for political emigrants who came to Soviet Russia to work for common turn institutions. That was a struggle to find accommodation. The most fortunate revolutionaries were all billeted in the same Moscow hotel, the Hotel Lux. One of those lucky few was Edward Fitzgerald, a London Irish radical who arrived to Moscow in 1922 and who found both employment and romance in the Soviet capital. Fitzgerald was employed in the youth wing of the Comintern, um, the Young Communist International, and lived for a period in this central Moscow hotel, the Hotel Lux. The hotel, originally opened by a well-known Moscow baking family, would play an unusual role in the history of international communism. Pictured here during the October Revolution of 1917 with a barricade in front of it, the Lux was seized by the Bolsheviks in 1919 and transformed into the living quarters of the World Revolution. Leading communists from around the world were assigned one of 315 rooms in this decaying hotel, which had plenty of conspiracy and cockroaches, but unfortunately only three showers. It's of note for our story for several reasons, one of them being that an early meeting to discuss the common turns relationship with the Irish national question was itself held in the canteen of the Hotel Lux, but also because it had at least two Irish residents. While in Moscow, Edward met another young revolutionary, Hilda Kramer of Munich. The two married while in Moscow and uh, they lived together in the Hotel Lux. One of their Hotel Lux neighbors was a revolutionary by the name of Henk Snevelis. He was a Dutch revolutionary who played an active role in the formation of the Communist Party of um, China and the Communist Party of Indonesia. And he would eventually be murdered by the Nazis on account of his resistance work in the Netherlands. This is to give you an example of the kind of remarkable connections that Irish people made in Moscow. In 1924, Edward and Hilda returned to Weimar, Germany. They became involved in the communist resistance, the rise of fascism, and they had one son while in Germany uh, to whom they gave the appropriately Irish name Desmond. Anyone who attended my London Irish talk a few weeks ago will remember Edward as the man who eventually fled to London following the Nazi rise to power and published accounts of Nazi brutality against Jews and communists. Here's a source which gives us an insight into the social life of the Hotel Lux, and it comes from the typescript memoir of Molly Murphy. Now, despite her name, Molly Murphy was not herself Irish. She was the wife of J.T. Murphy, a British Labour radical who was himself um, born to Irish um, immigrant parents. Molly Murphy describes the social life and night times in the Lux as follows. Back would go the furniture to the walls, and we would all indulge in song and dance until far into the night. Then we became really nationals, away from home, letting rip with all the old songs we could remember, from Tipperary and the Wobbly songs, from Irish Eyes Are Smiling, The Race to Loch Lomond, and lots more. And highbrows and lowbrows joined in. In 1924, not long after Edward and Hilda vacated the Hotel Lux, a woman from Wexford moved into a comfortable room with a balcony overlooking the busy Thruskaya Boulevard. She too would become part of the social world Molly Murphy described. Her name was Mayo Callaghan and her life was remarkable in almost every detail. Her room, Hotel Lux number no. five, became a kind of transnational literary salon where you could encounter veterans of the German revolution, visiting American intellectuals and Soviet cultural theorists pleading with those same visiting American intellectuals to explain to them the inscrutable slang in Ernest Hemingway novels. Mayo Callan was born into a middle-class Catholic family in Wexford town, but grew up in the small village of Ballinesker. Her father was an RIC constable, and the family valued education, sending both May and an older sister to university. May studied modern languages at the University of Vienna at the turn of the century, in the period when the city was alive with Freudian theory, avant-garde culture, and scientific discovery. In 1914, May moved to London, where she became involved in Sylvia Pankhurst's East London Federation of Suffragettes. Her talent was always translation, and by the time she arrived in Moscow in 1924, she was fluent in the working languages of the Comintern, namely Russian, German, and English, with additional knowledge of French and Spanish. This linguistic skill eased her rise in the Comintern apparatus, and within a few years she held a prestigious position as the head of press translation 
working in the Comintern, working both within the Comintern's headquarters on Mokovaya Street in central Moscow, and also within the Kremlin Palace. Political immigrants who lived in the Hotel Lux were in fact not known for their Russian speaking abilities. And Mayo Callahan's fluency made her a kind of intercultural bridge between Soviet citizens and these um, international communists. Here's a slide that features some of her remarkable friends. On the left, we have Sergei Dinamov, the Red Shakespearean, who was an expert on William Shakespeare's plays in the early um, Soviet Union. In the middle is Olga Minskaya, who was at then point, uh, who was at that point the highest ranking woman in the Red Army. And on the right, we have Sergei Eisenstein, who knew Mayo Callan and who many of you will know as a legendary filmmaker of the Soviet era. This image is one of my favorite images of May O'Callaghan. It's not a particularly good likeness. You wouldn't know it was May O'Callaghan, but for details written on the back. But what I love about it is what it represents about May O'Callaghan's particular place in the history of Irish emigration. The image is from around 1926, and Mayo Callan is the person sitting closest to the camera, and beside her is her American friend Ruth, who was the common turns librarian. And they're sitting on the walls of Novodevichy Convent, which was a convent that the Bolsheviks transformed into the Museum of Women's Liberation. But let's in introduce uh, a detail to complicate the picture. Mayo Callan, who is here sitting on a desacralized convent, had an older sister, who would become a nun in a Swiss convent and with whom she would stay on co in contact with for the rest of her life. So here we have two wildly different emigration routes from the same Wexford family, one into world revolution and one towards spiritual redemption, yet sharing in common an experience of sisterhood and a life committed to compromised ideals. Researching O'Callaghan's social life and her, her, her world has occupied my own for many years, and hopefully a book I'm writing at the moment might interest those of you drawn to her story. Mayo Callahan was partly responsible for organizing Limo Flaherty's tour of the USSR, a tour that resulted in a book titled, I Went to Russia. In 1932, a young and talented linguist from Donegal traveled to Russia herself, carrying with her a copy of Limo Flaherty's book. To my knowledge, Mairead Nivakin, known to all as Daisy, never met Mayo Callaghan, but their social networks were closely connected and their lives shared certain similarities. Born in Donegal in 1899, also like O'Callaghan to an RIC father, and raised in Belfast, Daisy studied Celtic languages and French in Queen's University and won a scholarship to Paris, which is where she first developed her interest in Russia. Back in Ireland in the post-treaty years, her apartment in Dublin became a haunt of Republicans, um, like Todd Andrews, who later fondly remembered Daisy in his memoir. In early 1932, she traveled to Russia as part of a teacher's delegation. And after the tour, she remained in Moscow, finding work in another commentary and institution, the International Agrarian Institute. She wrote evocative and playful letters to her friend back home, Kathleen Toomey, who was the wife of then IRA chief of staff, Maurice Moss to me. The letters describe an Irish woman finding purpose, romantic interests, and poor accommodation in a revolutionary city. She wrote that people here in Moscow think that Pat O'Donnell, the Irish Socialist Republican, is the future of Ireland, and all were interested in asking her about the strength of Ireland's Communist Party. Initially, the letters sent from her temporary home in Moscow's Grand Hotel speak of being somewhat lost in the society and its culture. I see all the bigness and newness here, she wrote, but living in this hotel and sallying forth into crowded streets is just like living in Paris. I feel I'd even like to meet a Fenian in the Belfast sense of the word. The streets, she noted, were much harder on boots than even Donegal. And by August, Daisy noted rather poetically, I find myself between two worlds. Another interesting aspect of the letters is how Daisy used the Irish language within them perhaps to evade censors, but also surely to create that link with home that immigrants so desire. She worried at one point that a translation she was working on would have contra credive stuff in it, using the Irish word for belief to express discomfort at having her name attached with Soviet anti-religious writing. 
Daisy's busy social life broke up dull days at the International Agrarian Institute. At one point in the letters, Daisy refers to a German communist whom she refers to as G. G was in fact Gerhard Eisler, a leading German communist and later a prominent figure in the DDR in East Germany. Eisler's brother Hans was a collaborator of Bertolt Brecht, the playwright, and his sister Ruth, another leading figure. Again, this suggests how life in Moscow connected these Irish immigrants to some really extraordinary people. Ultimately, Daisy's social world did not dissuade her from returning to Ireland. Later, however, Daisy would be back in Soviet Russia and would find love with a compatriot. But that's a story for a little later in our talk. Mayo Callan and Daisy worked for Comintern institutions as technical workers. But other Irish immigrants to the USSR were linked to the Comintern because they came as students of its revolutionary training program, the International Lenin School. What was the Lenin School? Think of it as being like Irish college, but everyone spoke, spoke fluent Marxist theory rather than Oskwelga. And instead of Kaylees, there was um, training in underground revolutionary tactics. Although I suppose there have been a few Irish language schools with paramilitary instruction. The Lenin School operated from 1926 to 1938, during which time world communist parties, including in Ireland, nominated students to be sent to the school for instruction in revolutionary tactics. Barry McLaughlin, who has also worked extensively on Irish Soviet history, notes in his work on Irish students at the Lenin School that 21 Irish students studied there. Only one was a woman, Belfast's Betty Sinclair, who would later in her life be involved in the Northern Irish Civil Rights Association. You can still visit the Lenin School today, as I did in 2018, and it's just a short walk from Moscow's Arbat district. It's no longer a revolutionary training school, it's the um, World Literature House. One remarkable memory from um, the history of the Irish in the Lenin School comes from the autobiography of Harry Haywood. Harry Haywood was an African-American radical and a leading theorist of black civil rights within the US Communist Party. Haywood shared his Lenin School dorm with an Irish communist from Antrim, Sean Murray, and he recalled that, this was my first encounter with Irish revolutionaries and their experiences excited me. As members of oppressed nations, we had a lot in common. I was impressed by their idealism and revolutionary ardor and their implacable hatred of Britain's imperialist rulers, as well as their own traitors. But what impressed me most about them was their sense of national pride not of the chauvinistic variety, but that of revolutionaries aware of the international importance of their independence struggle and the role of Irish workers. So let's explore as well the ordinary experiences, the day-to-day -day experiences of the student in the Lenin School through one remarkable example. Taken from the disciplinary record of one Irish student named James Prendergast, who arrived to the school under the alias Comrade Gordon. Early in the hours of a morning in February 1935, Prendergast was caught attempting to scale the walls of his Lenin School student accommodation after a night on the town drinking with two friends. So here's a situation that will be familiar to many of you who've ever done a study abroad program. A bit of mischief carried out behind the backs of your program coordinators. But what makes Prez, uh, Prendergast, Prendergast's case unusual is the context. He was required to frame all his deeds and misdeeds to the disciplinary panel using communist theory. Called before the school disciplinary board on the 17th of February 1935, Prendergast delivered a Marxian analysis of his attempt to drunkenly climb over a wall along with wider breaches of discipline. Prendergast offered that his behavior was rooted in an alien ideology, which I have brought from my own country. Continuing, he explained that as the Irish Communist Party was young and weak, is not surprising that the national movement is subject to petty bourgeois influences. Our next life story momentarily diverts us away from the fray of world revolution in Moscow and the mingled excitement and tedium of translation and study and to the artistic world of St. Petersburg, later Leningrad. Although um, you can, we can find details on the life of Rene O'Connell online, very little is known about her in English. Rene was an illustrator, an artist, born originally in 1891 in Paris, but who would spend most of her life in Russia. 
St. Petersburg, later Leningrad, was her home. She appears to have been a descendant of Daniel O'Connell, with Russian sources even describing her as a grandchild of King Dan. I've been unable to confirm this lineage, but if anyone knows a bit about the O'Connell um, family uh, genealogy, do get in touch. From 1910, uh, Rene studied at the St. Petersburg Imperial Society for the Development of the Arts, where she would study alongside other artists that later made their mark, including Nikolai Kuzmin and Ivan Bilibin. And um, Bilibin actually would later become her husband. And the remarkable thing about this is that Rene was not only Bilibin's second wife, she was his second Russo-Irish wife. He had earlier married Maria Yakovlevna Chambers, who was born to an Irish father in St. Petersburg. So Mr. Bilibin, it seems, had a type. Here's an example of, of Rene's illustration work. It's from 1914. It's a cover of Charles Perrault's famous Bluebeard, um, translated into Russian. You can see her, um, her name there on the text, and you can see how a O apostrophe name gets transliterated into Russian. In terms of uh, Rene's life story, she divorced, her and Bill had been divorced, and she married a man named Sergei Mikhailovsky, which gave her this wonderfully Franco-Russo-Irish name, um, Rene Rudolfina O'Connell Mikhailovskaya. She was also known as something of a beauty, and the famous Russian surrealist author Daniel Harms wrote in his diary in 1932 about walking home from her apartment one night, smoking, admiring Leningrad, and thinking about Frau Rene. There's a remarkable um, short reminiscence of Rene available online that was written by a great nephew, Maxim Sirnikov. He used to visit her in old age in Leningrad. He recalled and st stated that she was sent to Siberia during the 1930s on account of her foreign origin. And during her period in exile, tragically lost her children during the blockade of Leningrad in World War II. She was only able to return from Siberia, Sirnikov notes, following Stalin's death. It speaks to the remarkable twists of Irish diaspora history that an O'Connell family line ended in the siege of Leningrad. Rene lived to the age of 90 and died in 1981. There was one attempt by a family member to bring her back to Paris before she died. But by that time, her great nephew Sirnikov remembers she, had al she already had her own ideas about where her motherland was. So I've been unable to find out particularities of why O'Connell was exiled to Siberia, where she was sent, how she was survived, or how this impacted her life afterwards. But we do know a great deal about the life of another Irish person, tragically caught up in the violence and paranoia of the late 1930s Soviet Union. Porik Breslin was born in London in 1907 to Irish parents. His father was from Donegal. Yeah, again, another member of not only the Irish diaspora, but more specifically the Donegal diaspora in the USSR. The Breslin family moved to Dublin when, Pat when young Patrick was a child. He became involved in the Communist Party of Ireland at the age of 15, seemingly influenced by an uncle Sean who introduced him to the work of James Connolly. And beyond communism, Breslin was interested in other ideals and spiritual movements that crafted grand plans for the world. He took an interest in the invented language Esperanto and was also involved in theosophical circles, theosophy being an esoteric spiritualist religion that was quite um, popular amongst the intellectual and cultural elites of 1920s Dublin. Like comrade Prendergast, Breslin arrived in the USSR initially as a student at the Lenin School. He came in 1928, one of several Irish students nominated by Big Jim Larkin of the 1913 lockout and assisted in their travels by Larkin's lieutenant, Jack Kearney. But Breslin's interest in Eastern religions such as Buddhism made him an ill fit for the school and he was eventually expelled. He remained in the USSR, married a Russian woman, Ekaterina Kreutzer, and worked on translations. The quality of his translations continues to this day to be recognized. His English lyrics to the Soviet song, Native Land, were sung by Paul Robeson. And one of his translations was recently selected by Robert Chandler, the great um, translator for the Penguin Book of Russian Poetry. In the mid 1930s, Brezhnev's marriage to his Russian wife came to an end, but he would have the fortune to find and fall in love with a compatriot. Daisy Nivakin, who returned to the USSR in 1935. 
Here, Daisy is pictured with an Australian friend, Una, and a friend of hers named Jacob Miller, who arrived in the USSR initially as an exchange student from the University of Sheffield. We don't know how exactly Patrick and Daisy met, though, of course, Irish people have a natural propensity for finding each other when abroad. But we do know that their meeting sparked a romance and that it quickly led to marriage. In, in late 1937, Daisy, pregnant, returned to Ireland. And then in 1938, Patrick and Daisy's daughter, Mairead Patrikovna Breslin, was born in June in Belfast. Soviet and Irish authorities would not allow Porik Breslin, who had taken up Soviet citizenship, to restore his Irish citizenship and therefore allow him to return to live with his wife and daughter. Breslin remained in the USSR and struggled with the trauma of his disconnection from home while continuing some of his translation work. In late 1940, Breslin was arrested by the NKVD, the Soviet secret police. His flat on Moscow's Ogarova Street near the Central Telegraph building was searched and correspondence was seized, including letters from his wife, Daisy, and his friend, the Dublin Jewish painter, Harry Kernoff, who had first met Breslin while visiting the USSR in 1930. The NKVD prosecution of Breslin was fueled by a paranoia that emanated outward from Stalin, which fostered a feverish belief that Soviet society and even the Communist Party of the Soviet Union itself was riddled with saboteurs. The investigation used Breslin's correspondence and his links to other expats and people abroad to construct a fantasy case of him being involved in anti-Soviet activities. Sentenced by the NKVD, the Soviet secret police, with the charge of counter-revolutionary agitation after several months of interrogation, he later died with tuberculosis in a labor camp near Kazan in June 1942. He was posthumously cleared of any crime by order of the Russian government in 1991. Brezhnev was one of three men, the others being Brian Gould Vershkoil and Sean McAteer, who tragically fell victim to the darkest side of the Soviet dream and lost their lives. Brian Gould Vershkoil, a young and idealistic radical from Donegal, was lured onto a Soviet ship in Spain during the Spanish Civil War and arrested by Soviet secret police. He disappeared into the network of labor camps. Sean McAteer was an adventurer and a bit of a rogue who fled to the USSR after a failed bank robbery in Liverpool in the early 1920s. He was arrested in Odessa in 1937 and executed by a firing squad. You can read more about each of their lives in Barry McLaughlin's excellent book, Left to the Wolves, Irish Victims of Stalinist Terror. In 1956, Khrushchev's famous secret speech at the 20th Communist Party Congress focused the world world's attention and provided limited insight into the um, uh, scope of the innocent lives consumed by Stalinism. And it forced many communists to confront what they had known or allowed themselves to know about the reality of Stalin's regime. One Irish communist took a different approach and wrote a pamphlet denouncing what he termed as a campaign of defamation of Stalin, emboldened by what he said were sham communists and renegades in foreign countries. The author of this pamphlet was Neil Gould, who was in fact the brother of Brian Gould. Neil had lived in the USSR in the early 1930s, where he met and married Olga Ivanova Dolrova. After a period of internment in Ireland during World War II, some time spent living as a farmer in rural Waterford, and it seems a spell in England, Neil finally returned to Moscow in 1959 to live with his Russian wife and children. To draw our story further into the post-war years, I wanted to talk a little bit about the place of Irish culture and identity in Soviet life. Irish culture and history, you would be fair to say, never had a prominent place in the Soviet imagination, but it is possible to pick up these various intersections. What might be termed the Soviet historiography of Ireland actually has its origins in the aftermath of the Easter Rising in 1916. Patrick J. Little, who edited Republican newspapers during the Irish Revolutionary period and was later a long-serving Fianna Fáil minister, recalled in the 1950s meeting four Russians who visited Dublin in the aftermath of the Easter Rising. One of them, he noted, was the editor of Izvestia, a big daily newspaper in Moscow. Little also noted that this editor was killed in the revolution. This is, in fact, partially incorrect. Platon Kurzhentsev, 
the Bolshevik and editor of Izvestia in the post-revolutionary years, who did, it seem, visit Dublin after the Easter Rising, did not go on to die in the revolution. In fact, he went on to write the first Soviet histories of Ireland, the first published in 1918 and later republished in an updated edition in 1936. In terms of Irish writers available in Russian translation, the largest number of individual translated books came from the pen of Liam O'Flaherty, who had a wide number of his works translated over a contained period from the late 1920s to the early 1930s. James Joyce was naturally of interest to Soviet intellectuals, although in the 30s, Ulysses would be um, denounced as formalism. Um, but Soviet intellectuals who were tuned in to the intellectual currents of the wider world always picked up on what was going on and they were interested in Joyce. Copies, copies of Ulysses in English circulated in Moscow intellectual circles. At least some of them passed around by Ivy Litvinov, who was the English-born wife of the Soviet Minister for Foreign Affairs, Maxim Litvinov. But the best selling Irish author in the USSR by several country miles was Ethel Voynich, born Ethel Lillian Boole in Cork, whose revolutionary romance, The Gadfly, sold millions of copies across the Soviet era. Indeed, um, it was translated into, the 20, into 22 of the USSR's languages. And it was adapted for a film with a wonderful and famous soundtrack by none other than Dmitry Shostakovich. But did Ireland feature in any pre-war Soviet culture? The answer is yes. And there are at least two unusual examples. One a book, the other a movie. The movie was a Soviet adaptation of Treasure Island released um, in 1938. Because the original plot, which was written by Robert Louis Stevenson, considered a known petty bourgeois novelist who lacked class struggle in his writing, Soviet writers added in a subplot wherein the treasure um, that the pirates found was to be used to fund Irish rebels fighting the British. Also in an overture towards Soviet attempts at women's emancipation, the source material's main character, Jim Hawkins, was changed to a female character known as Jenny. Presuming all the tech works, I'm gonna show you the final minutes of the movie, wherein Jenny and her fellow treasure hunters her fellow treasure hunters ride out under a flag emblazoned with an Irish harp while a stirring patriotic song accompanies them. The dialogue for non-Russian speakers is typical late 1930s Soviet stuff, and unfortunately there's no subtitles available. The leader of the pirate band informs Jenny that she has proven that even a young woman can do her patriotic duty. And then Jenny hops up on a horse, uh, blows her trumpet, shouts, long live freedom, and after that, a song um, plays that includes a characteristically Stalin-era refrain, whoever is not with us is against us. But pay attention to the flag and its Irish harp. Спасибо, друзья. Спасибо, Дженни. Ты не напрасно переоделась мальчиком. Ты заменила юнгу. Ты доказала, что молодые патриотки умеют выполнять свой долг перед Родиной. Назначаю тебя адъютантом в отряд доктора Лайвиса. Great. Um, 
So I'm sure you, you are all stirred to defend the motherland after that. In the same year that left-wing pirates funded the Fenians on Soviet screens, an epic historical novel called McCool's Guard was published in Moscow. And it's set in the world of 19th century Irish republicanism. It's a perfect Soviet setting for historical fiction because it allowed the author Yevgeny Lan to write about a period during which Marx himself was alive. And each chapter, almost every chapter, begins with a different quote from Marx and Engels, Marx and Engels rather, on the topic of Irish peasants and rebels. But what about diplomacy? Who were Ireland's first diplomats in Soviet Russia? One could say that the first Irish emissary to the Soviets was Roddy Connolly. Perhaps more appositely, the um, first Irish person to arrive in the USSR in the role of diplomatic personnel was Violet Connolly. She was a UCD graduate who had been born and raised in Glasnevin in Dublin and joined the British mission to the USSR in the post-war years as an economic attache. Um, <clears throat> She later published detailed and highly regarded studies of Soviet politics, and eventually rose to the head of the Soviet research department in the British Foreign Office. Here's an earlier travel account by Connolly from the late 1930s, describing how a Soviet citizen reacted to her Irishness while listening to a news report about the Spanish Civil War while they were traveling, I believe, by boat. I saw the Wilhelm friendly purser glaring at me one morning from his cabin door where he was listening to Soviet news of the Spanish war on the radio. Irlanda fascista, protiv rabochik Espanya. Ireland is fascist against the workers of Spain, he called out to me. He had just learned from the radio that there was an Irish brigade fighting with General Franco in Spain. He was disgusted that revolutionary Ireland should now be fighting with the reactionaries against the people of Spain. So a suggestive comment, at once proving once more that Ono Duffy's Irish Brigade, Irish Brigade disgraced us across the world and throughout history, but also showing that these Soviet citizens associated Ireland as a revolutionary country. One keen observer of Ireland in the USSR, someone whose diligent perusal of the Soviet press and literature was bolstered by his clearly excellent knowledge of Russian, was the Republic of Ireland's first ambassador to the USSR, Edward Brennan, who arrived after the mutual Irish-Soviet sharing of diplomatic representation in 1973. Like Violet Connolly before him, Edward Brennan was respected for his erudite dispatches sent from Moscow to his reporting headquarters. They're a wonderful resource for anyone researching Irishness in the USSR, because Brennan did a lot of our legwork for us, clipping and photocopying different mentions of Ireland in the Soviet press. In Michael Quinn's work on Irish-Soviet diplomatic relations, he describes in detail the reports that Edward Brennan forwarded to the Department of Foreign Affairs. And Quinn notes that Brennan's interest in the Soviet press chimed closely with then Thesha Gard Fitzgerald's prime concern at the time, which was monitoring and coverage of the um, provisional IRA in the Soviet press. This image shows one of those documents that Brennan sent back to the Department of Foreign Affairs. It's a satirical cartoon from the well-known Soviet era satirical journal Crocodile that depicts Ian Paisley. So Ian Paisley is here described as the uh, leader of the Protestant ultras who is inciting a uh, pogrom, and it uses that very emotive Russian term pogrom, against Catholic workers. So Ian Paisley here, um, uh, not exactly a brilliant likeness, but nonetheless, he has a halo saying Ian Paisley over his head. And he is um, lighting up these bombs, which the Soviet reader is led to believe are going to be used then against Catholic workers. Um, but how did Soviet citizens get on the ground reports about Ireland? For the answer to that question, we turn to the story of Yuri Ustamenko. Three years prior to the Irish-Russian exchange of diplomatic relations, a friendly but somewhat suspicious Russian journalist showed up in the world of Dublin foreign, co foreign correspondence, Yuri Ustamenko. Ustamenko was the first Dublin represent representative for TASS, which was the Soviet equivalent of the uh, um, Associated Press. Early in his posting, Yuri received a shout out in the Irish Times for this 
and clear example of flattery. Dublin reminds me of Leningrad, he noted, and Leningrad is regarded as the most beautiful city in Russia. So if Leningrad is the Venice of the North, then Dublin is the Venice of the West. Like any and all Soviet citizens living on an island that had an open border with a region under British control, Ustamenko was a subject of surveillance. Um, John Mulqueen recently informed me on Twitter that Dublin journalists also assumed that Ustamenko was sent to Ireland to head up KGB activity. At one point, intelligence officers were perturbed by Ustamenko's unusual interests. Writing in a report to this Yori fellow had odd fixations on topics such as Celtic civilization and Irish pub culture. Was this a sinister Soviet plot to bring the secrets of our Irish social life back to his Moscow handlers? No. In fact, it was research for a book that Ustamenko published in 1978 titled Get to Know Ireland. Ustamenko's unmistakably Soviet and occasionally sharp commentary makes for an amusing read. There is an entire chapter um, titled In Occupied Belfast, recounting the author's run-ins with the RUC, a chapter about the Irish revolutionary movement, which features an illustration of some Irish pub communists attempting to one-up the Soviet journalist by saying, your revolution was one year later than ours, and a chapter on Irish culture that features snippets of an interview between the journalist and Luke Kelly. Elsewhere, Ustamenko delivers his final judgment on Irish pub culture. He notes that we drink too much outside of the home. He also made some remarkable discoveries. He claims that Catholics go to bed later than Protestants, and he also commented decisively that the Irish consider snow itself a natural disaster. In a chapter on the Russian language in Irish schools and home, Ustamenko um, includes an illustration of a Trinity College Dublin scene. Trinity had the country's first Russian department, and Daisy, who we've encountered throughout this talk, was one of the people who taught in that department. So now coming to the end of the talk, um, and there are plenty more stories to tell, but there's not enough time to tell them. And it's important to note that there's more people than me telling them. I want to give a particular shout out to an exciting PhD project underway at the University of Edinburgh, where Anna Lively is researching Irish-Russian relations from 1905 to 1923. Sure, of course, some of you in the audience will have your own Russo-Irish histories, but I wanted to end with a story from my own time in Russia. Before I visited Moscow for the first time in September 2018, I used Google Maps and an old map of the city to plot the current locations and places where Irish people and their comrades once lived and those locations that mattered to them. Each evening after my day in the archives, I would visit one of these locations to get a sense of the place, but also in a few cases to pay my respects to people who I felt deserved to be remembered. I visited the grave of Platon Kurzhensev, the first Soviet historian of Ireland, who was buried not far from the convent walls where Mayo Callaghan once sat with a friend in 1926. I passed by the old apartment of Sergei Dinamov, the Red Shakespearean, who played an important role in introducing Irish literature to Soviet audiences. On his last residence, there's a simple steel plaque marking that Dinamov had been arrested from this address in 1939 and soon after executed, swept up in the tower like so many others. And I traveled to the apartment where Porik Breslin, a husband, a father, and a talented translator spent his last years before his arrest. And there I noticed a curious coincidence. Not far from Breslin's last residence, there was an Irish tricolor jutting out from the wall. It was a signpost for an Irish pub, one of many now in the city, but it struck me as a moment of the accidental poetry of the universe that an Irish flag should come to be represented so close to a building where an Irish man found himself far from home. And um, one of the numerous remarkable Irish emigrants who made their way to the Soviet Union. The moment underlines what has always drawn me to these complex emigrant stories, stories of people who set out not only to find new lives for themselves, but to remake the world in the process and the hopes and tragedies that they encountered along the way. <clears throat> this migrant story is not unique to the experience um, of USSR emigrants, but those who traveled there lived it with a peculiar intensity. One metaphor for their lives might be that image with which I opened this lecture. 
an Irish migrant seeing the red flag flying foul, a symbol of ideals that had become contorted and earnestly attempting to set it right. Thank you, Svasiba. So <laughs> that ends um, the talk portion of tonight's talk. Um, I'm going to quickly uh, just post up um, some more. Oh, yeah, go back to the PowerPoint there, Carl. Yeah, no worries. Before we get to the Q&A, I just wanted to let you know about, um, yeah, cool. and then click back in. So um, this, is, this talk is the first in a series of talks that we're doing here at EPIC. Um, and uh, this slide tells you what's coming up. So the, the idea of this series is that we're going to look at a lesser known Irish diasporas. So the next one coming up will be on the 29th of October, Ireland in the Black Atlantic, and I'm going to be exploring some of the fascinating scholarship that has looked at Irish engagement in both slavery and anti-slavery, and also interactions between Irish nationalists and Black nationalists across modern history. After that, we're going to be looking at the Irish behind bars, so this, these are um, stories of Irish people in prison abroad and how those experiences have shaped both domestic Irish history and perhaps the modern conceptualization of ideas like political imprisonment. Um, the next one then will be Irish traveler communities abroad. So looking at the Irish traveling community and where they have settled beyond Ireland. After that, Irish Jewish and Irish Jewish histories, which will look, of course, self-explanatory in Irish Jewish history, paying particular attention to how the Irish Jewish diaspora has um, interacted and engaged abroad. And then our final lecture in the series um, is not itself a uh, history of the Irish abroad, but actually looking at the significant contributions that migrants um, have made to uh, modern Irish society and culture. And on that note, I'd like to particularly thank everyone who registered and made a donation to the really important cause that we've partnered with, which is the movement for asylum seek seekers in Ireland and their campaign to end direct provision and to stop deportations. So um, I haven't seen any of the YouTube comments, so I'm gonna get my phone and my moderating team is going to send over questions and heckles and all sorts of treats that you've been sending to me throughout the talk. So, and then hopefully we'll answer a few of them. Okay, wow, we've got great questions here. Um, so, um, <clears throat> question from Patrick Gaffey that could be answered quite quickly. Was the novel ever translated into English? I assume you're uh, referring to McCool's Guard. Uh, no, it was not. Um, it's in Russian. And uh, I haven't read the full thing, but what I did read wasn't really a thrilling read. So perhaps um, better to learn Russian to read Tolstoy in the original than to read McCool's Guard. Um, uh, so, oh, an interesting point from Philip McDonough, uh, who, of course, um, has worked extensively on Irish cultural relations and was an old a Moscow diplomat, and he said, I hope we won't forget Alexander Rowe, who I have forgotten, and who, in fact, I don't know about. So, Philip, I'd love to hear from you about Alexander Rowe's story. Um, a question from Simone B., which is, will have an interesting and multifaceted answer. I'd like to ask Morris how and where he found these interesting stories. Was it through archive research in Ireland or Russia, or through interviews or other methods? Um, it was through all of that and more. Um, I set out to learn Russian at the start of my PhD, and so I did archival research in Russia and in Ireland. And I've also um, been very fortunate, and some of the most meaningful moments of my research career have been meeting with the descendants of some of those who I spoke about this evening. Um, so, uh, a broad approach. Um, yeah, let's see. Uh, 
Oh, could I repeat the name of the Red Shakespearean? Sergei Dinamov, that's D-I-N-A-M-O-V. Um, question from Alison Martin. Were there many references to figures like Collins and De Valera in Russian literature? The standard Soviet histories of Ireland would, of course, uh, mention them both. Collins' <clears throat> death was reported in the Soviet press, but actually um, Anna Lively, the PhD student at Edinburgh, who I mentioned will be better able to tell you exactly how um, the Irish Revolution was itself uh, reported in the Soviet press. Um, another one then from Patrick Gaffey, which I think is important to talk about, notes uh, that I talk about a lot of Russo-Irish people from Catholic and Republican backgrounds. Were there any people in the USSR from Northern Protestant and Unionist backgrounds? backgrounds. Um, not all that many in my area of expertise, which is the 1920s and the 1930s. There is one example of someone who I can't quite remember their name off the top of my head. They're certainly from a unionist background because they apply in around 1932 to get a lecturing role um, in, uh, in a Soviet university. And one of the referees that they provide to try and get this lecturing role is actually Edward Carson. So uh, an interesting example. I don't know how a Soviet um, a hiring committee would have felt about a reference from Edward Carson. Um, uh, Luke Hoare Green asks, are there any places here in Ireland where one could visit to learn more specifically about the USSR Ireland links? Well, I've got to say, you can come here to Epic the Irish Emigration Museum, where we do explore a lot of um, Russo-Irish stories. Um, or uh, if you want more detail, just corner me in a pub whenever those pubs open. Um, uh, a question from uh, Donal Hassis. Hello, Donal. Um, he wants me to say something about Irish interactions with other anti-colonial activists at the Lenin School. Now, the most detail that we that I have found would be on the interactions between um, Haywood and the Irish students. I'm not an expert on the Irish at the Lenin School, but it was quite um, a siloed experience in many cases, and Irish were put in a sort of Anglo-American secretariat. Um, Places like the Hotel Lux and student accommodation is where they would have interacted and it's where you should look at if you want to find evidence of those interactions. I'll keep working away on that question in my head and see if I can come up with a few more specific examples beyond Harry Haywood. Was there any Irish musicians who played or collaborated with musicians in the Soviet Union? Now, one thing that comes to my mind, which is a very um, interesting example uh, for this is that one of the first Irish musicians to tour the USSR after Stalin's death was none other than Joe Dolan. So the Soviets got to learn that there was no show like a Joe show. Um, I, I, what is that in Russian? Someone will know. Nyet mnie kak Dolan show. I don't know. Um, Would it be possible to have a list of the published literature that I've mentioned? Um, yeah, happy to post a bibliography on Twitter. So I'll send you uh, some different writings on uh, Irish in Soviet Russia. That's from um, Lucia Scuteri. Thank you. Um, uh, Olga Krasnayak asks, would you find common personal characteristics, passions, qualities of those Irish people who found themselves in Soviet Russia? Certainly for the period that I look at, in the 1920s and 1930s, one, one thing that's really remarkable is that no one was ever two steps of separation away from each other. They all knew each other in some way, um, or at least knew someone who knew the other person. They all tend to come from a kind of uh, radical intelligentsia milieu or either in um, working class Communist Party activists. Um, and I guess what you could say about them is that when they arrived in Moscow, the people I research, they integrated what communism provided them with was 
a means of integrating very easily into an international community because these people would find that whereas you might think that Irish people would be united by a shared past, actually they were united with everyone in Moscow because they had a shared idea of the future. And that was a, a very important um, gel that connected them, not only to other Irish people, but to other uh, revolutionaries. Um, oh, sorry, uh, James Byrne uh, would like to um, ask about the daily, daily working lives of Irish emigrants. What was it like? Um, the daily working lives of common turn technical workers was really interesting. So I'll give you an example, a day in the life of Mayo Callan working in the um, common turn press department. She would wake up at 9 a.m. like early, I guess 9 a.m. or so, and they would go down to the hotel looks, oh, sorry, 9 a.m. is not that early. They'd wake up at around 7.30. She would go down to the um, uh, Hotel Lux canteen and she would have breakfast and it would be a very international breakfast. Her breakfasting partners were um, a German revolutionary, the black sheep nephew of a British MP um, and her American friend Ruth. Then she would go to the um, uh, Commentary HQ on Mokovaya Street and that was about 15 minutes by tram, 30 minute walk, down through central Moscow. And that was a really interesting building because at the time that, um, particularly when Mayo Callan was living there, you had people like Antonio Gramsci, um, uh, Ho Chi Minh, a young Ho Chi Minh was working there as well. And so this was a place that rebounded with the sort of clack of typewriters as people were working with this very dense um, revolutionary material, generally, um, speeches and debates would be had in the Kremlin Palace, and then those typescripts of those debates would come into the translation departments. They'd have, they would have to work very quickly, but also very professionally, to translate those documents into the various languages for national sections. And that's, I think, one aspect of um, this history that really fascinates me, and it's really under-researched, is actually how the common turn worked as a day-to-day -day technical operation, one that required um, a vast, um, a vast uh, degree of technical expertise, which was particularly provided by women. And there's an interesting uh, argument to be made there about how the gendered nature of women's education in the early 20th century and language instruction in particular, and secretarial instruction as well, led to women becoming the sort of ideal common term technical work. So that's a sort of uh, answer for that. Um, Yeah, uh, and uh, someone points out J.D. Bernal, someone I didn't look into in the lecture, but he's really interesting. He's from Nina, so actually not too far from where I'm from. For those who don't know about Bernal, he was a crystallographer, um, uh, I believe, uh, attached to Cambridge University, um, who was also a communist, a lifelong communist. Um, Liz Kais asks about... Um, References to Russia in the Irish Citizen. Uh, yeah, so there was a good few references to Russia in the Irish Citizen. A lot of them from Sidney Arnold. Um, and then a few of them from Conrad Peterson, who was, and I don't want to get this wrong, Latvian. He may have also been Lithuanian. But Peterson was similar to Sidney Arnold in that he was, you know, he would have called himself, after the revolution, he would have called himself Russian because he was from the Russian Empire. And I guess he wanted to emphasize that Russian aspect. He married an Irish woman, and, and there's an account in The Irish Citizen of Conrad Peterson's marriage to an Irish woman. And in that account, they note that Maud Gahn officiated at this um, marriage celebration. And she said that this marriage um, symbolizes the growing links between our two countries, uh, Russia and Ireland, which have you know set out on this revolutionary path. So that's one interesting example. Irish Citizen, um, had a number of uh, references to also other world revolutionary events um, in Budapest, the Hungarian Soviet, and, um, and some mentions as well of the German Revolution. I actually have an article on that in History Ireland, um, so I can share a link to that on, on Twitter. Um, Adrian B., to what would you attribute the strong Donegal connection to Russia? Honestly, I'm at a bit of a loss, although um, Dahi Hartery, uh, someone who uh, tweeted at me recently when I talked about Donegal, 
uh, made an interesting point that Pat O'Donnell claimed that Donegal was the most politically advan advanced county in Ireland, um, second only to Clare. So perhaps there's something there. Um, Yeah, and so again, there's a lot of people uh, uh, um, talking about different examples, really interesting examples. Um, Sergei Tarutin mentions George Reavy at the time of the Great Patri Patriotic War. Um, the USSR was editor in chief of the frontline newspaper British Ally, published in the Russian language. Um, uh, yeah, there's just so many stories. Uh, there's so many stories to tell. Um, and Thank you for everyone who's who's posting a lot of these in, in the um, YouTube comments. And to be honest, there's a few that I don't know, which is great. I, I'm going to really look forward to following up on a lot of these. Um, so, um, Jeremy Curtin asks, any Irish turn up in parts of the USSR outside Russia? Um, Yes, as emigrants in the period that I've researched, particularly the interwar period, not so much. Um, Moscow's dominant. You have another um, Leningrad case who I didn't mention who's really interesting, Hubert Butler, um, an Irish writer. Um, I mean, Irish people traveled beyond uh, Moscow. The Irish Friends of Soviet Russia 1930 delegation to the USSR which lasted for six weeks. That delegation traveled um, to Azerbaijan and traveled through Georgia. So they um, traveled also through Ukraine as well. So tours, yes, um, I'm sure there are examples of emigrants outside of Russia, but I can't cite any for you right now. Um, no. Do I know if there are any people from Leitrim who ever mo moved to the Soviet Union? I don't know. I'd have to do a control F for the word Leitrim in my PDF notes, but perhaps there's some Leitrim connection to the Soviet Union. Um, And yeah, just to note uh, a kind of a first comment that came in here um, from the family of, um, of uh, Daisy and Patrick Breslin, um, both daughter and uh, grandchildren, another extended family. So hello to all. Um, I'm really glad that you could make it in particular. Uh, yeah, so do we have any more questions? I think we're going to uh, wind up. So um, yeah, thanks everyone. It's been really great. Uh, stay safe, uh, keep washing your hands, and send me a message, and happy to talk more. See you all.